Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. You're seeing all the guests that are going to be on today. I think we have a plus one as well. So we do have a few rules for today. So um, you're on the webinar, set in a webinar setting, so we can't see or hear you. Um, your video and audio are muted, but if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll make sure we get to them. Uh, the recording night is being uh, recorded and will be posted on YouTube for everybody to see. So there you go. Charlotte, thanks. Great. There we go. So good evening, everybody. I'm super excited. My name is Jeff Abramowitz, and welcome um, to Artist Transformation and Justice in the Carceral System. I am super excited to be here. I am the CEO of the PD Green program. And for the next hour and a half, I promise you, you're going to be engaged. You're going to um, hopefully learn some things, but you're going to hear some remarkable stories. And I've had a chance to meet uh, all of our guests and talk to them and see some of their artwork and the things that they've done and hear their stories. And it's absolutely uh, just remarkable. Before I do, I want to talk about a few things and to set the tone for the evening a little bit. So as you may know, this is um, being sponsored and being run by the PD Green Program. So the PD Green Pro Pro Program was founded in 2008 and um, it was founded and named after the, it was named after uh, PD Green Jr. who was um, a, he was a disc jockey in Washington DC and he was an active community activist and media personality and founded here at Princeton University by the class of 1958. We have over the years um, worked with um, thousands and thousands of students in, in the carceral setting and also behind both behind the walls and, and at, as they've come home to get people smarter. Uh, we use college students and other volunteers to go inside of prisons and jails and work with them so that they can reach their academic goals that they want and hopefully find that career pathway to the next, to their future. PD Green program is really excited about running this um, this uh, forum tonight, and we are um, we are also having a lot of different events that are coming up over the few months you're going to hear about. But in particular, two that are high on our radar screen. One is a 5K run and walk. Uh, one uh, we're going to have two sites for that. One in Princeton. Uh, near Princeton's campus and one in Boston. So check out the 5K family uh, walk and run. And it's also going to be virtual. So if you are anywhere in the country and you want to participate, just get out there, put your sneakers on and go for a run. And the second one is our Going Green event. 
uh, which will be an event happening in November. You'll hear more about that tonight, which is also going to be, it's going to be honoring Jane Golden from the Mural Arts Program. And we're going to be uh, doing a lot of fun activities that night, but it's going to be including our auctioning off art from a number of individuals across the country who've been just as impacted. So really excited about both of those. I don't want to waste any more time because we're going to wrap up and I'll give you all the details. We'll put the links in so you have them all. But I do want to set the tone a little bit for tonight's session and what we're going to be talking about and why this is so important to me personally. So for those of you that may know or my story and some that may not, um, I was a lawyer for a long time and made some bad choices that landed me in a federal prison. And I ended up serving a, a five-year sentence uh, upstate Pennsylvania. And during that period of time, I um, came, um, I really learned all about art and as well as reading and writing, but art was the one thing that I found that I never expected. So I should tell you that when I was growing up as a child that I was the student in class who had a hard time staying within the crayon lines uh, during kindergarten class. Um, I just didn't believe I had an artistic bone in my body. And while I was away, I was in the art room talking to someone and they said, Mr. A, you need to paint. And I'm like, trust me, you don't want to see me paint. I just didn't think I had anything in me that was artistic at all. And he said, no, Mr. A, just try it. And he gave me some brushes and, and paint and said, just do it. And I said, do what? <laughs> and he said, just do it. Just do whatever you're feeling. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm feeling like I could use a, a good pizza right now or something and and just nothing. I, I didn't have any idea. So he gave me a picture and he said, here, just try and paint this. And it was one of it was a, a leger. It was all of lines. And he said, oh, it's pretty simple. Just use a ruler and follow your follow the brushstroke with the ruler and you'll be able to do it. And I spent about an hour and a half or two hours working on it. And um, it wasn't very good. But it, it was during that hour and a half that I found I was just, I was transformed to a different place. I wasn't in prison. Um, as much as I was in a cinder block wall, a room with, with no windows and um, just some lockers for art supplies, I, I was outside of the prison walls during that time. And it became so impactful for me that I found myself in all the free time that I had, which wasn't that that much, but whenever I did have free time, I was in the art room and um, I got canvas and somebody gave me brushes and paints and I got started. And, and it was this really cathartic thing that ended up doing a number of pictures and paintings. And one recently that I can share with you was of a Matisse. Um, I recently was at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia and got to see that painting uh, up on the wall that I had copied uh, when I was away and actually brought home. And I was at an event where the men at SCI, I think it was SCI Chester, SCI Phoenix um, in Pennsylvania had an art exhibit at the Barnes Foundation and their artwork was up in one of the rooms, which was remarkable that they were able to share it. So art plays a really special place and has a very special place in my heart. And when, and especially during that period of time when I was incarcerated. So what you're gonna to hear tonight are stories of, of, of individuals who have gone on similar journeys and have been able to find that, that place, that special place that art fits into their life and what it means for them coming home. So that's setting the tone, I think a little bit about what you're gonna to experience tonight. And we have a, a great uh, cast of um, uh, of guests tonight. Um, and I know that uh, one individual was not on the original screen. So uh, Mark Loney has joined us tonight too, Mark. And thank you so much for joining us because you have a remarkable story and you're going to share your artwork, which is just amazing. So where do we start? So Maria, I think we're going to kick off with you. Okay. So, um, so you should know a little bit about Maria. Uh, Maria, uh, is a dedicated advocate for social change and criminal justice reform. She channels her energy through art. With She's got over a decade of experience in the behavioral and mental and behavioral health field, and she utilizes her skills as a visual artist to create meaningful impact. Uh, she holds a BFA from Arcadia University and MFA from Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which is just amazing. What a great place. Um, she's got such a long laundry list of accomplishments. Uh, she's an alumni of the Center for Emerging Visual Arts Fellowship from 20 to 22, uh, 2020 to 2022, and a recipient of the Leeway Foundation for Art Change Grant in 2014. She's the founder and director of Brush with the Law, 
a nonprofit organization committed to community service and reentry arts. And Maria's influence just transcends art. Maria, um, I thank you so much for joining us. So before we begin, I don't know if um if Charlotte, if you have a, a piece or two that you can show the audience of Maria's work. Is it possible? Let's see if she does. There we go. So Maria, with the pictures up there, why don't you unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about you and a little about the work that you do. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so these are some paintings that I did. Um, these are a little, a little bit older, but they're my female series. Um, and they had a lot to do with uh, the American sense of emptiness, uh, where it's like these beautifully glamorous people, but nothing really, it, it just has a, a, a very, it has a sense of emptiness in them. Uh, so this was not my typical painting style that I would normally do, but for some reason, I think after the Academy, I wanted to prove myself in some way because uh, during my master's program, I I worked more on like a landscape type. I was trying to find myself, which actually, you know, I I I I, I still paint that way. So this was almost like I think I graduated and was like, you know what, I I need to show that I can I can do these things, and so that's why I painted these. I love it. Thank you, Maria. How did you get started in art? When did it start? When did the passion start? So as a child, I, that's all I really did um, was not really drawing or anything like that, but coloring, like I colored and I, I, I remember in school, uh, every Valentine's day, it was like my job. I made myself that job uh, to make these Valentine boxes. And when we would have book reports, I would like have to have all these visual drawings and images in them. And then I, I don't know, in my teenage years, I, I kind of could have used some more guidance <laughs> in my life, but <laughs> anyway, it didn't work out that way. Uh, so it wasn't until after I uh, got a divorce in my later 20s that I started thinking like, well, I got to get a job. I got to do something. I have these kids, you know, I, I don't know. I got to get, I have to make money. And I didn't have a college degree. And I always felt like I needed one. I just felt it just was always something for me because I was always a bookworm. And anyway, so uh, it took me back to being a child. And I was like, well, I remember my grandmother always telling me, oh, this is the artist. This is our artist of the of the family. And I didn't really understand it then. But then when I was in my 20s, I was like, well, that's what I need to do, because that's what makes me the happiest is when I'm sitting there creating it. And that's what I, I went to Monco and I was like, hey, look, I don't I first tried to go to Tyler and they were like, you should probably just start at Monco, maybe just to get your feet back in the water. And so I did. So I went and uh, I loved it and I learned I learned the skills I needed. Awesome. Good stuff. So we're going to talk more about your journey in a little bit, but I want to get through. Have everybody introduce themselves. Cody, um, tell us a little about your story and we'll see if um if Charlotte has some of your work she wants to share with everybody. But tell us a little about Mark, about Cody. Hi, everybody. I'm Cody Stoltreger. Um, I guess I could I could describe myself in many different ways. Um, I think the things that are most relevant to this conversation, I'm formerly incarcerated and I'm an artist. I was uh, incarcerated in Pennsylvania State Prison in 2001 and um, yeah, ended up doing 20 years in there um kind of drove my life off the rails in my teens and uh yeah that was that was how that ended up and um <clears throat> i'd always been been something of an artist I'd, I've, I'd always felt drawn to art and um but i was never really able to like focus on it and um just apply myself as a as a kid and then as a teenager and when i ended up in prison and like so many things were stripped away art was still there and I found I found my way back to it. Uh, started out by just making like greeting cards, um, just little little simple stuff, you know. And um, it just escalated. <laughs> I guess I just uh, you know started building on it and kept building on it, and it and it evolved. And uh, 
this is the more more years that went by, the more I really started to like believe in myself and my ability and, and really challenge myself and um, you know, just see see how far I could go with it. And I uh, really poured myself into it for about about 10 years, about my my the second decade that I was incarcerated. My um yeah, my life was art, study, music. I mean, it was yeah, I was I was immersed in it for years and years. So. Wow. So were these drawings that are being shown uh, on the screen, are, were they done inside? So the one, the uh, chair, my chair, Stoltrager's chair, which is a um, a play on Van Gogh's chair. If anybody, I, I was reminded when you, uh, Jeff, when you were talking about your Matisse, you know, I was, uh, I kind of copied Van Gogh. I mean, adapted it because his was actually like a, you know, a basic chair with a pipe on it. And, and uh yeah, I was I was incarcerated. This I think I made this in 2018, maybe 19. This might have been 19, like right after we moved from Greaterford to Phoenix. And um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot. A lot of thought went into it. I don't it's I think the meaning of it's still kind of vague to me. But um, yeah, just trying to push it and see see how far I could go, see if I could make something beautiful, but also something that says something. And um, the one on the right here, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, that that I made, this that was about a year ago, and that that was after I'd been released. And um, yeah, it really be really became clear. I, I'd known it for years that this is the way that it is, but I I really became clear once I was home, and I was um, often doing the same work that I was doing while I was incarcerated, but for like a hundred times the the pay, you know. Wow. Great stuff. So we're going to talk more about your inspiration for all of this too, but just great work. Great work. Um, so Daniel, um, you're up next. Uh, can you tell us a little about Daniel and Daniel, you are a different medium. So you're not a, um, you're, you're not a painter, um, but tell us about your work and, and what you do. Thank you. I, I, I will. Um, Hey guys, I'm Daniel Kelly. Um, I also am formerly incarcerated. I was um I was incarcerated when I was 17 years old. Um I ended up doing 27 plus years in uh New York State Penitentiary. Um and there I um before I go on, I want to say that I am I'm somewhat jealous of you artists with all your 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 lines and your and your structure and your colors and all that stuff because it's awesome. And I've always wanted to do that, but I was never good at that. So my medium for expressing my art became words. Um I I traded I uh I replaced I replaced paints and brushes and 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 easels and and canvas for words, alliteration, um, metaphor, simile, you know, that became art to me. And it was really, it was really impressed on me in prison because even though I, I was a former Bronx High School of Science student, so one would figure I was okay with words, I did pretty well in English class and things like that. When I was incarcerated, I looked outside of my window one day and guys were in the yard. And there was this one gentleman who I still see to this day, uh, Mr. Chad Taylor, this guy was awesome. He was in the yard, he was, he was rhyming and he drew such a crowd. It was awesome to me. And I'm straining to hear this guy from, from my window. And I'm like, wow, I was amazed by it. And obviously we don't get, uh, we don't get brushes and easels like that in prison. So my paintbrush became my pencil, my pen, my canvas became my uh, paper. And I began to write I began to write and I was scared to death when I went out outside in the yard and guys were congratulating me. I was like, I was nervous. These guys were convicted felons. So I'm in the yard, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my art, I'm showcasing my art and I'm scared to death. But eventually 
I got pretty good at it. And now I am the arts and literacy advocate for the creative arts department in the Fortune Society. And there I'm but one of a cluster of stars there who, who share their, their uh, spoken word poetry. We, we, uh, we speak about how others' spoken word makes us feel what we think about it. And the critique is awesome. It's like our, our personal therapy sessions. This is really awesome. This is really awesome. I, um, I see how, how guys and ladies, they, uh, they get up in our music cafe, which is part of our creative arts uh, uh, forum. They get behind the mic and either they'll say uh, a spoken word piece they may have, or they'll sing a song. And we encourage that. Now, I've heard our participants destroy some of your favorite songs. <laughs> destroy them. But it's beautiful because what that did was encourage somebody else who was scared to get behind the mic and do it it encourages them to go for it and do it. And that is so empowering and encouraging. It's a beautiful thing to see. And um, and I love it. And I'm witness to this every week. I'm, I stand and bear witness to the power of encouragement, the power of motivation every week when I see it. And they pass it on. That's beautiful. It's beautiful to me. Um, we now have we now have uh, a liberation library to to establish literacy amongst our participants. It's a beautiful thing that's happening. So art in it in and of itself is something that that it it empowers our participants and it empowers everyone. So when I see that you can draw really well. Yes, I'm still somewhat jealous, but <laughs> it's beautiful because it shows that you have a talent that no one can take from you. You have a talent and we are all empowered by it. And to see it, it's, it, it resonates. It truly does. It truly I does. I love it. Dan, Daniel, thank you so much. We've been showing while you've been talking, we have the smell of, of the stars. Uh, by uh -huh. Daniel Kelly up there. And I hope everybody had a chance while you're talking to, to read it because it definitely is impactful. We're going to come back to you in a little bit to give us more about your work and the work you do. I want to introduce you to the last person on our panel tonight is uh, Mark Loney. Mark and I uh, met not long ago. We actually met at the Barnes Foundation during that e exhibit, I believe. And uh, we started talking and he gave me his card. He said, you know, we got to talk. And and, um, and he told me what he did. I said, I need to see your studio. And we ended up uh, going out, grabbing a bite to eat and, and taking a walk over to his studio after dinner. And uh, Mark, tell us a little about um, yourself and the work you do. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Thank you for having me. And uh, thanks to everyone at the PD Green program for all the work that you do. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of this discussion. Uh, my name is Mark Lotney. I'm a formerly incarcerated artist. Uh, I got serious about art while I was incarcerated in 2015. Um, I think uh, one of the most, uh, one of the more well-known bodies of work that I have is a series of portraits that I started while I was in prison called Pure Defeat. They've been part of a show called Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Uh, I drew 800 portraits of my friends while I was in prison. And um, I'm continuing to work on that project now in an iteration that uh, highlights people who are in support of reform efforts. Um, as you can see around me, uh, there's quite a bit of stuff on the wall. So when I was in prison, I drew and painted every day. And it was my, uh, my, my way toward redemption. And uh, I've seen the, the, the healing process that art can provide for so many guys. And um, I also wanted to highlight the fact that um, 
you know, education is so important and what you do at PD Green is so important and art education is also so important. And I do believe that uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do in regards to bringing art programming into prisons. And I can't overstate the importance of uh, art as a therapeutic tool. And um, I'm just grateful to be here today to talk about what I've been doing. So thanks so much for having me here. No, so Mark, you, you've you've left out really the the brightest star, which was your project that you have the um, the sketches that you've done and the profiles you've done of of inmates um, were all done in um, in pencil, and um, that exhibit is actually now on the walls uh, in a hallway at the United States Department of Justice, um, yeah. which is totally remarkable. And I had the privilege, um, I guess, about a month ago, maybe, to sit for. Um, a portrait for you uh, that's going to be in your new uh, part of your new pro your new project. So of 800 on the outside uh, people that are working against mass incarceration. So thank you for all you do. We're going to um, you guys are all amazing. So there's a lot to talk about, but I really um, want to open this up. So there's not any form structure. Anybody that was ready to jump in, just jump in. We're also be voluntold to answer the question, just letting the groundwork you know right now. This is these are the rules. But I want to start with um, how important was art in helping you successfully make it through your journey? Um, how what what role did it play in your your life? Obviously, you guys were all involved in it in some fashion in the in the correction setting. But what role did art play in that on all that? And how important was it to you? And we want to kick us off. I'll go first if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sure. thanks for that question, Jeff. Uh, well, for me, it was uh, it was paramount. It was the thing, the the reason that I got up every morning to, um, uh, to it was the thing that I focused on that um, also helped me to uh, mark time in a way like uh, I was able to use um, the supplies that I had to kind of like meet out um, a certain amount of months per se, you know, because like getting supplies in prison was also like a bit of a hurdle. And it, it also was a little bit stressful, but it was a good stress. You know, there's so many of these other stresses that were bad stresses. And then art making became a good stress where I was able to focus and get better at it. And um, it was very meditative. And uh, the benefits that I got from it were just, uh, I have, uh, the, the of of all the things that I did while I was in prison, I think art making was the single most beneficial thing that I could have possibly done. I love it, Cody. You were about to jump in. Yeah, here we go. Um, so a few things, right? I think um, something that I felt while I was incarcerated, especially early on, was like um, a lack of self esteem. Something that I struggled with, and I think that's a thing in um, in prison generally. I mean, people end up there often is, have hit some sort of bottom, right, in their life to have end up, ended up there. And um, for me, it was a way to, to uh, like, be good at something, to, be, to, like, pour my energy into something, to feel good about something that I was doing and something that I was making. And then as an extension of that, I was able to gift people, you know, who uh, many of who, who I'd harmed in various ways in the past, my family members, friends. Um, so it was really, really helpful in terms of that, giving me, like, just a little bit of belief in myself, something that I could build on. And then, um, wow, so, so many things. I mean, it was beneficial to me in so many ways. Another thing I would say is that it, um, once I really got into art and really started like spending time with other artists and, and meeting outside artists through mural arts presence in, um, in Greaterford prison, I, um, I started learning a lot more about what, what I was going through and about what we were going through collectively. You know, it's um because that was like required. It was like prerequisite to to make art that was about mass incarceration. And it was actually about what I was going through to was to was to learn about about the history of it. And, um you know, what it's all about. Learn, learn some of the numbers. And um, so it was really beneficial in that in that way. Cody, we're going to get to the other ones on this, but Cody, you mentioned the mural arts program inside. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little about what that program was? Like, what, what was its structure? What did, what did it do? What, what was the program? Mm -hmm. So I hope, I hope Jane tells this story at the, uh, at the uh, going green because she'll definitely tell it like better than I can. 
But um, yeah, she she went to Graterford Prison in um, I think in 2002. I'm not even sh I can't even remember like how she ended up there. But um, it started out as just one mural, a short, you know, a, 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 an agreement to be in there. Mural Arts would have presence in there for maybe the six months or whatever it would take to make the mural. And um, they ended up staying and they built a program there that um, it employed me, it employed others in, in the prison. It became my job. And um, every day I was able to go down and work on whatever projects they were working on. They would have an artist, a liaison artist. Um, Maria was one of those artists for a while back in, uh, what about 2016, maybe 2017. And, um, yeah, through that program, we'd be able to work on murals that were, uh, that are out here today in, in Philadelphia. I can go and look at the murals. I can go touch them murals that I painted in greater Ford state prison. And, um, yeah, beyond that, I mean, it gave me, uh, I built a lot of skills, but beyond that, it gave me something to do out here some 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 skills and some an organization that i have uh, a relationship with that that can employ me and can really uh keep you know keep me moving on that right path that's got to be the greatest feeling to drive down the street and see a mural you worked on while yeah, you were amazing. incarcerated yeah it really is wow. amazing yeah that's and there's so crazy. many of them too so many of them, of them over the years so maria talk to us so you should know that PD Green had a saying on all of his radio shows. He used to say, talk to me. Yeah. Maria, talk to me. Tell me. Tell so, me about your experience. Uh, well, yeah, like Cody said, I did use, I used to go uh, and see them uh, at Greaterford a couple times a week. And we would have art class and we uh, drew from life and um I have a, a a recording of Cody. Actually, he made a recording for me after he um, came home, and it's really touching. Like it still gets me every time I'm in the car and I hear the song. It takes me right to to him. Uh, so when I was there, I used to. I, I love I love uh, Plato and the allegory of the cave, and I always found it. I still find it so relevant today, and. Um, it, I don't know if you know what the allegory of the cave is, but it's a really interesting story. And anyway, so I found out that John Lennon had actually used one of the lines from Plato's allegory of the cave in his uh, watching the wheels. I think it's what, yeah, watching the wheels. Mm -hmm. And he says um, where he talks about, he's fine with watching the shadows on the wall. And if you listen to these lyrics and then you hear, Cody sing the song. It's on the Brush with the Law face uh, social media pages. But the if you understand what the allegory of the cave is, and then him singing the song, it's just incredible for me to to, wow. to have it, that as a gift. And I'll I'll never be able to thank him for that enough. So Maria, did you you volunteered inside the prisons? Uh, n well, I uh, at Montgomery County Correctional Facility. That's where I started the program for Brush with the Law. Uh, and the, the warden there was uh, Julio Algarin, and he was considerate enough to allow this program there. And he wanted it to start with the women, I think, because there was some hard thing that had just happened at that time for the the women in that side. So we, uh, I would go there and we would uh, do Greek mythology every week and we'd read, because I love Greek mythology. <laughs> I love all these fantasy stories. Mm -hmm and Joseph Campbell and I, anyway, so I would bring all of that into the jail with me and we would, we would learn and we would draw and we would make murals all over the place. So I would, but the reason I went there to volunteer or to start the program, which is now called um, Brush with the Law is because I wanted to understand what was happening in the world with addiction and incarceration and, what would if it who are these people and what is happening in their lives and that helped me understand my child who uh has addiction who has mental health and um substance use disorder and as well as a first husband who died from it from the opioid crisis epidemic wow. So, so I'm curious, yeah. I'm curious, Maria, the first time you went inside the prison, what did anything surprise you? I realized how 
lonely it felt. I how and cold and uncomfortable. And I felt watched very closely. <laughs> you were. <laughs> you were in a prison. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was um, but I met the most beautiful people and I'm really grateful for that. Awesome. I love it. Uh, Daniel, tell us, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, the art of having um or the luxury of having a pen and paper um, for your craft is a little bit easier to get at inside of the walls because you don't have to try and get brushes or paints through commissary or other places. But um, tell us a little bit about your experience and how important was it to be writing inside? And I should tell you, writing, um, for me, there's a great line that says, reading opens the, the door to your heart, but writing opens the window to your soul. And there's something about writing uh, for me that's very cathartic as well. But tell us about uh, the importance of writing in your journey. Well, don't tell anyone this. Writing does two things. It enables the writing and sleeping are the two things in prison that allow you to escape. Yes. When you write, when I write, I'm allowed the freedom to go wherever I want to go. I am no longer behind bars. I am wherever I want to be. In Zurich, in another continent, um, when I go to sleep, I can do the same thing. I can dream. And with the pencil, I can document that. I can say whatever I want to say. I can make other people feel great with what I say. It's an awesome feeling, but it does. It, it, it enables one to go wherever they want to go. It's extremely important for me. Um, I know that we have a saying in our writing workshop. We say that words are spells words have power so when you are a spell caster of that skill level you seriously have some serious power it's awesome it's an awesome thing truly so thanks daniel so i got a question for each of you to answer i'm going to go around the horn i don't care who starts but i'm curious as to what inspires you like what inspires you to do what you do Maria, go ahead. <laughs> no. Mark, they're all itching. I see you. you all got your fingers on the pads there. So anyway. I, I, what inspires me is, I guess, the, I, I, it's not only, but it surprises me sometimes, like what I want to make and what comes out. Um, but then I'm really driven, like with this latest, couple of things that I've made. Um, I think it's to see the response from others, like to see what they get from it. Like I, when I was in school, I always liked the sublime and that really, I didn't, you know, like I, I would make very atmospheric paintings that were far out and um, I, I, yeah, atmospheric, but I really, I, I really enjoyed seeing the viewer's reaction to whatever. I, I enjoyed the beauty as well as the dramatic uh, winds or skies or anything. Yeah, so I like the sublime and it has played through in all of my work since then. I love it, I love it. Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> I, might, I might be preaching to the choir, but like Maria, I love Greek mythology. <laughs> and I love oh. to see I, I love to see the reaction to whatever comes out of my pencil, my pen, you know, mm -hmm. on the paper. If I say I love that, I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by 
how I can make another person feel with what came out of me. Um, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. interesting. I'm curious, um, Mark or Cody, what do you got? What inspires you? Go ahead, Cody. Okay, Mark. <laughs> we'll save the best for last. Um, yeah, so a few things. I mean, number one, money, which I know that sounds sound stupid, and that's not really the answer we're looking for. But at this point, it's my job. This is my job, and uh, and I love it. I love that I'm able to make a living as an artist, wow. making art. Um, it's awesome. You know, I don't don't feel like I ever want to do anything else again. <laughs> and um, yeah, nature. I mean, nature is a thing, and and I include uh, human nature as well in that. I mean, I love mountains and trees and deer and raccoons and all that sort of stuff. But I also love um, people and just seeing like the thing, the things that we build and the ways that we that we move through the world. Um, that that's always inspiring to me. I find beauty in a lot of places that um, might might not appear to be beautiful on the surface. And then a third thing, which I think closer to incarceration, more relevant to mass incarceration and, and criminal justice reform is um now that I know, just trying to like help others understand, you know, what's going on, help, help try to take like that message, what I've experienced and the friends that I've made and what I've seen people experience in, in the criminal justice system, try to take that to like a larger audience and help people who have a lot less contact, a lot less connection to what, what we've gone through and um, help them understand what we've gone through. And uh, hopefully get them on board with trying, trying to, trying to change some of it for the better. Well, that's awesome! What a great response. I, you know, I just I don't think any of us really thought about the monetization, like working and mm -hmm. and actually being able to support yourself as an artist in this space. I know Mark does, but Mark, yeah. what you want to hit on what inspires you? Yeah. So just like Cody, the very last thing that Cody said is that our we we're obligated now that we have been. Uh, you know, enlightened with this information that there's such a big problem in America. And we have uh, a way of bringing that discussion to people who normally might not have thought about these things. You know, um, art is an incredible way to uh, talk about things and to put an idea in front of people who normally wouldn't have thought about things uh, like mass incarceration. And um, as every time I go to Eastern State Penitentiary and I stand in front of that big graph out in the yard and it just highlights the, the craziness since 1970 to where we're at now with the, with the prison population, that um, just the, the pure scale of it is what really uh, motivates me and inspires me to keep doing what I'm doing and bringing the message to as many people as I possibly can. And that's my it motivation. It seems like you guys, yeah, it seems like you guys all have this sense of responsibility to like convey a message, like to really share your experience in some fashion of, you know, what what's touched you. But I want to, um, I just wanted to mention one thing is that I think I differ from all of you in this respect is that um, I didn't do, I didn't do an, an art inside of prison or jail for anyone else. Like it was a totally selfish thing. It was just for me. Like I didn't care what anybody thought of my work. They because they all would have given me different things, I'm sure. But but the truth was that it was something that I was proud of. And it was the first time, I mean, as a lawyer, you're always doing th things to make other people happy. And it was the first thing that I really had done in my adult life that was just for me. It was just for me. It was just that I felt proud of this and no one could take that away from me, no matter what they did. So I think that it differed a little bit for you guys because you all had a sense of, you know, that what the impact was to other people and it's getting around this messaging theme. So what's the message that you want to transmit in your art? What is it? And Mark, I want to start with you because you showed a piece, you have a piece behind you that I'd like you to talk about, which really um, which really tells a, a lot more about the work that you do. So can you kind of kick us off and tell us a little bit about um, the messaging and, and and what you try to uh, accomplish in, in the artwork you do? Which piece is it that you're talking about? The the little, the I call them the caterpillars, the bots. The bot flies? Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
This is Mark's that museum, one? everyone. <laughs> that one there. Oh uh, yes. yeah, so I, I call them bot flies. And um they are um representative of a transitional life phase. Um they're black and white stripes like prisoners, and they have um this imminent uh sense of um something about to emerge, you know, and um the bot fly in reality is is a, a parasitic um insect that pupates on a person or a, a host, uh, an animal, and it kind of grows on them. So uh, this idea of reform, I feel uh, it definitely needs to grow on people. And uh, that's uh, the the tool that I use to bring that discussion um, up is, is with the, the bot flies. Um, the, the question that you asked, though, what, it was a different question. What was the first question? It was about the, the message. Like, what message do you want to send in the work that you do? Sure. I, well, I mean, the, the message that I I think um, kind of runs through all my stuff is, is uh, um, just a message of uh, lightheartedness, of love, of acceptance, and um, um, just trying to make things a little bit better. And um, by taking a little bit of personal responsibility um, on each of us, we could all uh, raise the tide for, for everyone. And um, I think uh, as, as we come to realize as a country that uh, the way that criminal justice uh, has been dealing with crime, not working it's kind of just serving to perpetuate more crime um and if we deal with it with uh, a perspective of love and acceptance and healing um i think we'd be in a much better position wow so cody i want to jump to you and then i'm going to get daniel and then maria on the same question but cody in particular for you like you're right you're um it wasn't until you said it that i recognized van gogh's room that you've put that chair in and mm -hmm. um i was recently at exhibit i saw the picture of the van gogh the his room picture which has a bed in it not just the chair but has a bed in it mm -hmm. but i'm curious cody what was the what's the messaging that you like to you like people to know in the work that you do well, so I feel like it's um, I feel like it's changed over the years. I especially it especially changed once once I was once I was free, once I was released from incarceration. Mm -hmm. um, I would say at this point, the messaging in my art and um, really in my life, is that um, I'm out here free in the world, right? And there are a lot of other people who are stuck in prison, and uh, many that I don't think need to be there any longer. People who have been serving like just incredibly long sentences. Um, I, and a lot of them that are, that are artists that I've befriended over the years and have maintained friendships with, even after I've, now that I'm down, that I'm home. And um, yeah, I just think about it constantly about how I'm free and so many of them are stuck in there and I'm not better than them. I'm not, you know, they're, they're, uh, those are, they're a lot like me in many ways. You know, they're artists, they're people, they have families, um, they made mistakes. You know, they've they've hurt people the same way I've hurt people. And um, there's just there's just no uniformity. There's no it really seems to be no rhyme or reason sometimes with the way that the sentences are handed out. And, um, you yeah, with the amount of years that, that people end up doing in prison. And uh, so that's it. Let some people out. That's my number one message is uh, let let's mm -hmm. stop. Let's stop using trying to use prison as like a fix for all of our problems. I love it. Oh, Daniel, um, you said something earlier, which struck me in line with this question of what your message is, is words are powerful. They are. I, words are so powerful and they can have such an impact on people. I'm wondering in the in your writing, like what is it? What's the, the message that you share or like to share when it comes to incarceration and being behind the walls? Well, before I get there, I will say this. If we all agree that America has uh, America has a serious problem uh, with math, mass incarceration, then I believe our message should be one fashion to stem that 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 tide. 
to stem the tide. You empower, you motivate, you uh, galvanize, and you make sure that this that that prison industrial complex doesn't uh, keep moving as efficiently as as it has been. Um, when I say words have power, you have power. And as a purveyor of words, uh, Jeff, you know that when you speak these, these powerful words, they have meaning. You don't have to commit that crime. That, and our youth out here, they are doing whatever it is they wanna do. And they are at risk of visiting that uh, prison. So if if we fashion our words to empower, to motivate, to ward them away from the criminal justice system, we are the actual boots on the ground to stop it. We are that. We can do that. We can motivate. We can inspire, and we can we can stem the tide. I truly believe that. It's great, powerful Ooh. stuff. Maria, what inspires you? By the way, it's a beautiful picture behind you. But what inspires you? <laughs> Thank you. I just started that. I love it. Um, I, 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 there's so many things that inspire me. I mean, the color of the clouds, the all that kind of stuff. But uh, when I started this venture, it was to bring people together. I didn't even know I was doing that <laughs> until like from diverse and adversarial communities to and it to generate new concepts and theories and methods and um, move beyond discipline specific approaches to address larger social issues. Um, I I I um, I'm attracted to the psychological forces like unconscious unconscious to conscious, but I have a lot of different inspirations from cool. it's definitely the conscious and unconscious that that definitely interests me a lot so so thank you for that we we're all we're going to dive a little bit deeper into something now which is a little touchy so i i want your and maria you may not be able to answer this one but we're gonna we're gonna go around the horn anyway because i'm wondering if you guys you, you all have any feelings on being known as a, a formerly incarcerated, incarcerated artist. And does the, the qualifier, formerly incarcerated artist, does, does that mean anything to you or, or change the way you um, feel about your work or the work that you do? Or am I just totally off base when, when you use that? I'm, I'm curious your reaction. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I thought I knew how to answer this. I feel like, um, I mean, it's something that I, that I have to own at this point. It took me a long time to get to the point where, um, you know, where I really owned who I was and, uh, the things I'd done the ways I'd lived my life. And, um, yeah, once, once I, um, once I was able to own it, you know, and, and process it, I, I never stopped owning it. And, um, you know, at this point, I wouldn't wouldn't quite say that I carry with pride, but it's um it's really meaningful to me at this point. You know, it's such a big part of like what what I went through in my life and um, the people that I'm now connected to as a result. And, um, yeah, I'm going to continue continue to carry it for for myself and for for everyone who isn't able to be be here out out in the world uh, wearing that same that same moniker or label or whatever you want to call it. Mark or Daniel? I know that. Go ahead, Daniel. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Form the, the 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 term formerly incarcerated. It doesn't bother me. Uh, the way I I would have thought before it would have because while I was incarcerated, I met some amazing people there. Amazing, who I would have never thought. What are you doing in prison? So now that I'm no longer in prison, I realize that I have this all access pass to humanity that doesn't grow old. It doesn't have an expiration date because, you know, I'm a human being. 
I'm a human, just like you. So what? I was incarcerated. I know better now. And not only do I know better, I believe that I'm qualified to teach you a thing or two about staying away from there. So being formally incarcerated is, is not necessarily a badge of honor or anything, but it just adds a bit more quality to my life. Mm. Mark? Uh, yeah, so I got to be honest about this. I'm so fresh out of the can that like I'm a formerly incarcerated everything I do. <laughs> it's like at the forefront of my mind i ride the bus i'm a formerly incarcerated bus rider you know what i mean like i feel like i'm still partially there you know so calling myself a formerly incarcerated artist kind of is like therapy for me to bridge that gap with people who i might be otherwise uh disinclined to talk about you know where i come from so uh yeah and like cody was explaining there's a there's a whole group of us where it's kind of like we're we have uh a fraternity almost of like these these people who have experienced this uh prison situation and now we're trying to make art to talk about it and uh i just wanted to say to uh maria and daniel who i i've never met before i think you're both awesome i know cody a lot uh oh. better than yeah. any uh anybody else here but um uh cody and i have, have been uh pretty close and and it's these relationships that we form, you know, through these kind of things that, that really help to um, keep me going, you know. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Good deal. Um, Maria, what's your what are your thoughts? Um, would you do you, um, your students come out or they're they're working in the program? Should we even be thinking of them as formerly incarcerated artists? Aren't they just artists? Yeah. That's how I, I, I don't know when we, uh, so I, we had class today, uh, but it wasn't, it's more, uh, we, uh, oh my God, <laughs> I was in Norristown at Hope, Hope Works and we did a, um, uh, we do class every Thursday and um, it's a lot of people who are unhoused, who are in reentry, uh, who are in recovery or some in active addiction. And Everybody, it just there is no labels. We just sit and we all, uh, I'll bring in like an idea, like um, we'll work on whatever painting. You know, we'll pick a Van Gogh or we'll we'll do a craft or whatnot. But no, we all just sit and talk. At the whole idea is to just sit together as a group and create and talk, and that's what we do. And these amazing pieces of art come from this that I wish I had more to show you, but I don't have any here. But I think when they walk away from that table, they feel really good. I feel good. And they, we're all hugging and see each other next week. I mean, I don't think of anybody of where they're, where they're coming from or what they've done or anything. We're just in the moment creating together. It's a crazy, it's a crazy, beautiful thing. And it's the kind of thing that it really transforms people. And if if they are housing having housing insecurity, it kind of is a short time where they have a roof over their head and they can they can take themselves outside of that, just like painting and the humanities inside of prison. Um, do we do enough in prison and jail for really making sure people get to experience art? Like how many of you guys had art instructors inside? Or a really um a, a, a full class where you know they taught you um the best painting techniques or, or for Daniel, you know, writing style and having somebody that, that mentored you inside that taught the, to taught the arts and, and really was able to guide you. Um, should we be doing more for, for men and women that are incarcerated when it comes to the arts? Can I, can I just say first? Sure. And then I know it's not my, they have the answers to this, but as a person who did go in as a volunteer, it was very difficult to be there. Like they make, I don't mean to be like they against us, but the volunteers are highly scrutinized and you don't, you don't get in easily. I wish I, I wish I would have known better at the time, you know, to just mind my P's and Q's and 
be humble and just, yeah, that's all. I, I think there should be a lot more, especially at the county, there isn't anything. You just sit there. Um, but yeah, I, I think there should be more, but they know better. But I think that's the culture of a lot of our prisons and jails is to make it really difficult to bring some of these programs in. And I think institutionally, we don't, we, it's got to come from the top. I mean, our wardens and our superintendents have to uh, emphasize how important it is to give people the opportunity to engage in painting and writing and, and all these different, and the different kinds of arts that might be available inside. And I, I don't think it, I don't think it's gotten there yet, just like education still hasn't gotten there yet. You know, we have some education programs inside of our prisons and jails, but not nearly enough. Look at the PD Green program and the tutors that we have inside. We should be in every prison and jail in the country helping people get smarter. But the truth is many, they make it oftentimes very difficult to get into some facilities. And a lot of times it's not a priority. And we saw that during COVID when most of the class education classrooms shut down. So I'm curious, um, were, are either any of you aware of what happened during COVID inside with the arts? Like were any of the art programs able to continue or not? Um, so from my own personal experience, there wasn't much of an art program prior to COVID in the facility that I was in. There wasn't one. There's uh, a mural program uh, that, you know, at first glance on paper on their website looks as if it's existent, but you get in there and there's really not much happening. There's only three of us on the crew. It should be a lot bigger than it was. And that was the extent of an art program. And um you know, I I know that uh, a lot of a lot of the artists that I knew kind of it was like they were drawing heat to themselves by being an artist. You know, they were they were being targeted. Uh, I personally have been written up a couple times just for you know my art making and acting too professional about it, and uh, that shouldn't be the case. You know, people have an opportunity to pursue this thing that that, that really helps them, that is meditative, that is curative almost, and well, for sure it's curative, and we're and uh from the top down it seems to be stomped on instead of uh cultivated or uh given the proper resources to use as a tool for therapy and for healing and for making people better and there's always room for uh for more programming no matter how how many programs you think a, a prison has we need another one so uh mark mark i'm curious too in your work you had 800 portraits that you did while you were away wasn't there ever a fear that you were going they were going to get taken away of course yeah so i had to smurf them out so i sent them out like 25 at a time and uh that's how i would have to go to the mail room and mail my stuff out and it was always a bunch of hurdles just to get to the mail room just to get the stuff packed up just to ensure that it got to home you know so it wasn't like uh i was uh, um there, there was a there was a policy in place that ensured that these things, these good things, uh, that were helpful, not just to me, but to others, you know, in my family and uh, um, in my community, and to you know, better uh, be a part of society in a positive way. Those things weren't really um, at the forefront of, of the policy. You know that it wasn't really looked at like that. And I could understand the security aspects of, you know, the prison and, and how that all goes. But uh, I think it's also very, very important to take into account the things that help people and that help the general, the bigger picture. Mm, great, great response. Um, Cody? Well, I could just add real quickly, right? I mean, we... Um... So I think we're we all hear like the phrase is thrown around once in a while about like most of the people in prison are, are going to be getting out of prison at some point. Right. And that's true. I'd say it's probably something like ninety nine point eight percent of the people who are in jails and prisons in this country are are going to be re released back into free society at some point. And um, yeah, why? I mean, why not give them some tools while they're in there to try to come out and do better than they did before? I mean, it's that simple. You know, give people, help people find some education, help people um, learn how to read, help people learn how to paint and feel good about themselves and feel confident and, and grow some skills and, um, you know, be able to come out into the world after incarceration and, and just do better than they did before. So, so raises a good point. I'm going to kick it off with Daniel on this question, which is 
um, how how your work has served as a mode for healing and transformation um, or justice for you, like in, in this whole experience? Um, this is, this that's a good question, Jeff. Um, when I write, I'm able to, I'm able to apologize to any and everyone I affected with my actions uh, leading me to prison. And um, it's freeing, it's cathartic for me. Uh, I want to I want to give credit to one of one of my professors, uh, Janine Pommy Vega, who was uh, who was my uh, poetry instructor and uh, she she had us writing and she critiqued our work and you know I always wanted a good grade so I did my best but what it did for me personally it it allowed me the way it, it allowed for me a way to free myself up from some of the guilt that I was suffering from it uh it gave me reason to believe in myself, to believe in my humanity. Unfortunately, that's not the way of prison. Prison, prison isn't in the business of rehabilitation. That is not, never going to trump the punitive measures they have in place to deal with anybody that runs afoul of the law. I get that. Um, I know it. And I simply use my words to motivate. I use my words to empower. And I hope, I hope that it resonates wherever it comes from, in whoever ears it goes into. So, so that's a great answer. I, I'm curious, you know, we talked about uh, this, the, the healing piece of it. And I think we spent a lot of time tonight really talking about inside. And I'm super curious because Maria, you mentioned doing work on the outside with Hope Works, which is a, um, a huge fan of, um, a good friend of Dan Roden's. Um, but I'm, I'm curious for all of you, um, how important is the work you did inside and how did it, how did it move to um, the outside? Like, what was that transformation like coming home? I know, Mark, you talked about your ongoing project and Cody, I think you're starting to realize your, the professionalism of it, but in your life, like how hard is it, how important should it be as part of our reentry experience and really making sure that people leave in incarceration and maybe that they don't lose it. Look, it took me a long time. I put the brushes away when I came home. I recently, within the last few years, pulled them back out and, and got that feeling again um, that I had when I was inside. And it took a long time for me because it was a trigger for me. Um, this I started painting inside. That was where everything I knew and coming home and, and then starting to do it again was like just reliving the experience. And, um, and, and it was kind of hard for me to kind of get back in the groove when I came home. But how important is it to in the re-entry world to get people doing their art again. And Cody, gosh, can you start us off? You made a profession out of it. So it had to be impactful for you. Yeah, it's, um again, Mirror Arts. I got to give a shout out to Mirror Arts because not only do they do the, uh, they run a program out at now Phoenix, which replaced Greaterford, but they um they also have a re-entry program. A, um, well, I don't think they label it as a re-entry program per se, but it's the Guild. It's called the Guild and it's, um. It's for justice impacted individuals, most of them young, younger than I am. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was great. It gave me a little little part time job when I when I first came home and um, was able to get on my feet through that. And that was great. And just be able to like like breathe a little bit, you know, and, and um, and also get get into my art and figure out what what that's going to be to me here on the streets, you know. And um, also, I want to I want to say, too, that it's. um. The arts to me have been like really important since coming home and that like in prison, I had so much downtime, you know, there was so much time. It was it was up to me to some degree, like how I, you know, how I structured my day. I could say I'm going to give like three hours to painting or I'm going to go play guitar for two hours or or I'm going to go running. And now like 
being home and having to keep up with bills and just like the life is much faster paced and um art art can really be a break from that you know for me and that's really helpful to me when i'm able to just sit down and paint for a few hours put the music on and just kind of like check out of that put the phone away for a while you know I love it. So um, we're going to, I'm asking each of you this question because I'm curious about it, especially for, for Daniel, but Maria, you're doing this now on the outside. You mentioned being in Montgomery County today. How important is it for those people, Justice and Pacta, that you work with um, when they come home? Yeah, you're muted. It's okay. How important is it for people to be involved in the arts when they're reentering? Yeah, it's part of that process. I think it's really important. In fact, when you were talking about how when you came home with the brushes and they, it it was too hard for you to be a part of that because it took you back there. I, it's the work I've done lately, uh, especially the one that's called Under the Microscope, is I couldn't not do it until I, I had to get out what I had I wanted what I had been holding in for so long that I had written in books that I had, I needed to tell my story. And the whole time I did it, I couldn't wait. I, it was so upsetting and it was really depressing. And, but I had to keep doing it. It wasn't like I could stop because it was like, I am determined to get this out there. So I'm understanding what you're saying. You, when you picked up the brushes and it took you back to that place. But I think it's really important that you do that because you need, as hard as it was for me to sit there and write these stories on these little microscopes slides and rethink of what it looked like watching something I, you know, calling 911, you know, or an overdose or whatever. I feel so much lighter now. Like I'm able to, I know we're talking about reentry, but I'm just talking back on the the paintbrushes mm -hmm. thing with you because that really got me there. Because it took me when you said that it took me back into that booth and being sad and crying and. But I feel I've learned so much from that. So you might want to think about why you, you, those paintbrushes. You got to do it. You just have to do it. I hope you do. I know. I did. <laughs> I did. I have, the canvases are out again. Good, good. Um, as for it. the entry, it's. I think it's really important. It gives you a, a space to like sort your your brain out, and it it can also. It's also important because it's nonverbal. If, if you're doing it in a um, in a artistic, not that the spoken word is not, but I'm saying in a nonverbal way, you can use the arts to express yourself, and you're able to examine what it what it might be like to find clues within yourself within the work you've done i think it's a really important thing i love it i love it great response i'm going to um mark up i want to uh daniel next and then mark but before i do i just want to announce to everybody that if you have a question for our panel um please throw it in the chat box we have a little bit of time left we got one more Big round of questions that I want to get to, but um, if you have a chat, if you're curious about something of the work that they've been doing or their, their journeys or experiences or a comment, please throw it in the chat box. I promise we'll get to it. Um, Daniel, we're talking about um, re-entry and imp how important it is. Now, you work for one of my favorite organizations in the country, the Fortune Society, and I, I've, um, I'm i a huge fan uh, of the Fortune Society and the work that they do. Um, and that's pretty much what you do up there is work with men and women as they come home. How important is it for the people that you work with that you see every day in, uh, in the work that you do? It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. The arts, they are, they are very important because the arts are welcoming. They're welcoming. They don't care what you look like. They don't care how expensive the clothes you have on are. They don't care. If you're good, you're good. If you're not that good, but you just aspire to be so, the arts welcomes you. They welcome you. Um, I haven't seen anyone shunned from our arts program because it's so welcoming. 
everybody wants to do something, whether it's visual art, painting, drawing, or, or spoken word, poetry. Maybe you want to sing. Maybe you want to do these things, but it's so welcoming and it's very necessary because it, it welcomes everyone. It doesn't care about your age, your religion, your race, your weight, nothing. It doesn't care. Art welcomes everyone. Everyone. Great answer. Great. Mark. Uh, so I think I have a two part answer for that. Um, personally, uh, art making in my reentry has uh, been um, huge. Um, and I've had so much support for my art making upon reentry. And uh, without that support, I wouldn't be able to make the art. And um, I wanted to acknowledge Art for Justice Fund and Mural Arts Program. Uh, huge supporters of my of my practice and I uh, just wanted to thank them um, and also uh, I believe that uh, re-entry programming around art um, aside from my personal story but uh, programming I think is uh, extremely important on re-entry because it brings people together who normally wouldn't have been brought together um, people can feel safe in that space and it's just a great way to kind of unwind and uh and feel the the meditative effects that art therapy can can have on you i love it i love it so we have we do have some questions so you guys ready so we got some great people in the audience and thank you for your questions continue to throw them in there but i'm gonna i'm gonna go from the from the bottom up because um, Anna Maria is a, she's a student, a, I think she's a graduate, a senior at Princeton University, where my office is, and uh, she's writing her th her uh, senior thesis, so she wants us to be able to connect to all of you for her thesis, which is on the intersection of arts and programming and mass incarceration. It's like, we just did this webinar just for you, Anna Maria, just <laughs> so you know. Um, but her question is this, it's been interesting, to, she says, it's been interesting to listen to everybody. But is there um, a bit more personal question she wants to pose? What can people do be doing for the arts programs within prisons? Like what research can be done to help expand those programs and bring really bring attention to them to show the great work and how it's been so impactful? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I just I'd like to chime in here and just say that um there are there are good examples out there. There aren't many. I mean, there aren't enough of them, but there are there are some good examples to look to. There are the, some programming that has been done um, in Pennsylvania that I'm fam familiar with, and I'm sure in um, in other states, whether it be um, painting, like that sort of like visual art or uh, music or poetry workshops. Um, yeah, there are, there are examples out there, things that can be, uh, you know taken as they are, maybe like improved upon or take pieces of that or adapted to whatever particular um, art form, you know, you might want to try to take into a prison. It's interesting, Cody, because there's a program at Chester, see at Chester that is um, called the Real Rap Program, which mm -hmm. is a blend, Danielle, of bo Daniel about uh, both poetry and spoken word and also art. And they mm -hmm. gave them an entire room that they paint. And I was sending in art um, I was art supplies for them to paint the walls and got a chance to go in and actually paint my name on the wall mm. um, in the room. But it was a mixture of spoken word and art in one room that was just dedicated to them for the art room. And I think maybe um, sharing some of those projects out and shedding light to them in the public of how, how impactful they are to people. And maybe even a study, Anna Maria, if you think about it, a study on looking at the impact of art and incarceration. And, you know, what's the recidivism rate for people that get involved in art projects when they come home? I think that'd be really kind of cool to, to dive into. So um, great. anybody else have a comment on that? Sure. Um, so there's a, um, he, uh, he's an art therapist. He was the chair of the Florida State University, and he did a lot of art therapy research um, with incarceration. And she might want to look at that. Uh, his name is Dave Gusick. 
Gusak, Gusak, David, David. I'll put it in the chat. That'd be great. And you can watch some videos on him that interviews. Um, he's he's written books. He's really he's a good source for what you're looking for. Cool. Um, I we had another question. Uh, Brian, who's a returning citizen himself. Um, is it possible to make a weekend retreat vacation to do mural work with Brush With The Law? Oh, I'm sorry. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. There's a yeah, future. He, he was curious about whether there's uh, whether it's possible to make a weekend retreat vacation to do a mural work, a mural work with Brush With The Law. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> I, we would have to talk about it and figure out where and is it going to be with an organization or are we just going to do like a big mural and just figure out who gets it after or that would be, I would love to talk about that. There you go. We're going to, um, we're going to get all your information out to everybody so that they yeah. can find out about brush with the law. Um, Peter had a question about, do you have any recommendations on how PD green tutors can encourage students to express themselves through written word, poetry, or prose? Anybody? How can our students, how can we encourage our tutors to um, to encourage students to express themselves in some of these mediums? How can we uh, help the tutors in the prison system? How, like, yeah, how can we encourage those tutors to express themselves through written word, poetry, or prose? This is a question. Okay. I believe, I believe it's important to work through prompts. I believe that when you when you give someone a prompt to write to, uh, it's also cathartic for them. And if they would like to read what they wrote, and then you may want to have them look and see their audience watch their audience, watch the responses from their audi audience, watch their faces, because these words came from you. Mm -hmm. Words came from you. So the feelings that they elicit, that happened because of you. When you, when you turn someone on to the power, to the power of words that they have, that's a very empowering thing very it's almost addictive it's almost addictive because once that happens they will see how powerful they are they will see that they can uh promote change they can promote well-being and not only themselves but when they uh spit their art it's awesome it's i love it it's great stuff so we are we're wrapping up and coming to the end of tonight and you guys have all been remarkable before i before we go and i close um i just want to go real quick around to each of you and if we wanted to get hold of the work that you do or connect with you um i'm going to ask you to put your contact information if you like in the chat box but just give it to us verbally um uh, we'll kick it off with maria if we wanted to find out more about brush with the law how can we get there how can we find out uh you can go on instagram at brush with the law or the website is brushwiththelaw.org or you can find me um at m manios um oh there you go awesome yeah good deal we love it um danielle we wanted to get hold of you how can we do it uh you can get me at daniel.r.kelly73 at gmail.com. Or just yeah. Google Fortune Society and go in at Fortune Society yeah. and find yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Cody, where can we where can we learn more about your work? We want to hire you as an artist. We got some projects for you. <laughs> Well, uh, that, that sounds great. I'd love to do it. Love to talk about it. Um, this is still like a work in progress for me, like trying to get my art career off the ground, figure out what it's all going to be. I don't have a website. Um, you can find me on Instagram at, at code, C-O-D-E underscore stool, S-T-O-O-L, code stool. Love it. Good and uh, reach out. Let's talk about art. Message me. Slide into my DMs. Let's talk about some art or something. There you go. I love it. <laughs> 
Mark, we all want to sit for portraits for you, Mark. Everyone on this call, we want to get cool. you 50, 59 more people that are going to sit for your portraits. So how Let's do we do reach it. you, Mark? So the website is lotneyart.com, L-O-U-G-H-N-E-Y-A-R-T.com. The Instagram handle is at lotneyart. And real quick, check them out. Who's that guy? PD Green. PD Green. Green. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, Mark, you you lead me to the next, uh, the last few things I want to talk about. One is that we do have um, the Art of Educational Justice program coming up. It's honoring Jane Golden. It's going to be November 18th at WHYY. It's going to be from 7 to 10 o'clock. And don't worry, if you can't come to Philadelphia for this, you can do it remotely. We're going to have watch parties and you can get on virtually. So I'm hoping we'll have a lot of people on. Going Green is going to be a really fun night. But here's the key thing. All of you artists out there that are listening, that want to participate, we're going to be auctioning off your work of art. And you get, you're get you getting a percentage of all the proceeds that you bring in. So if you really want to make this, um, make some money out of this and, and get your artwork out there in the public all across the country, it's a great way to uh, donate some artwork. You'll, um, everyone, just uh, going green. We're going to put the link to the event in the, in the chat box so you have it and hope you'll join us for that event. We also have a 5K coming up on October 28th, uh, uh, 1 o'clock. And it's a 5K walk run, one here in Boston, one in Princeton. And we'll be uh, we'll be walking and running with our family and our community. So I hope you come out for that. Just a good, fun afternoon. I would be remiss if I didn't thank a few people. One, um, the PD Green Program staff, who are just remarkable. They're family. I've only been here since December as a CEO. And they are just the most remarkable group of people. And I love my job. I love my family here at PD Green Program. So thank you all. Two people for this event. One was Charlotte Saunders. Charlotte has been the PD Green sign that's been on the on the uh, been on the screen the whole night. So Charlotte, thank you so much for getting this all together and putting the pieces together. And also Sarah Hirschhorn, who's off today, but Sarah um, was instrumental in orchestrating this whole thing and getting all our guests on. So I want to I want to thank you um, all for being on this really important discussion. We will be putting it out on YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it and share it out. I want to thank all of our guests that joined us tonight, and I want to end with this um, last thought, which is really that you know, art is the one thing. Art and the humanities are, are one. They're one thing that you can do inside of prison that no one can take away from you. And that's the one thing that can help you um, get to your next chapter, get through a really difficult situation and really find yourself and make um, make bad, you know, make some really good things happen in a really bad situation, bad, bad circumstance. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do more and more and more inside of the world of our prisons and jails of getting people uh, getting the talent that's inside of the walls. Um, to really explore their talent inside and when they come home, use it like all these wonderful people have done to um, really better society. And that's really what it's all about. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank all of our guests. You guys are amazing. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing you at the gala, to sharing your works, to participating with um, Brush with the Law and uh, Mark sitting for your portraits and everybody else. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And the PD Green program says thank you. Well, have a good night, everybody.